Hi, I'm Jonathan Weiner, and welcome to season six of Are You Listening? So for this episode, I'm going to walk you through mastering a rock track. And just saying that sentence out loud begs as many questions as it provides answers. For instance, what is rock? When the time comes to take a look at the tone of a track, maybe I'll talk a little bit more about differences in rock styles and the signature of the sound of rock. But rock has meant so many things through the ages uh, that I think you can probably substitute the idea of modern rock for this video. So let's get started. I'm going to be working on a song by a band called The Dahus, Mark Paget being one of the co-writers, and the name of the song is Urgency. And it's a fun, kind of melodic, kind of punk, kind of cool song. I hope you enjoy it. When I sit down to start working in a mastering session, there's a whole bunch of stuff that I do as part of my pre-flight checklist. Like I'll make sure that my clocking settings are set properly. If you use an external clock for your system, you make sure everything's pointed to it. I'll make sure the clock actually matches the sample rate of a track. And I'll get some other additional information about the track that I'm going to work on. Lots of different DAWs and systems will give you information about a file when it gets to you. In this case, I'm going to pull the file into the Isotope RX standalone application just so I can understand a little bit of something about the levels of the track. In the lower right-hand corner, I can see that I'm dealing with a 48K file. When the time comes to generate the file, I may need to give the artist a 48K version for a video shoot, a 44.1 version for an aggregator sending something out to Spotify, different bit depths or different bit resolutions, depending on whether they're going to a 16-bit format or a 24-bit format or a lossy file format or vinyl. But here I can learn something about the, the file that I've been given. You can see the peak level's way lower than full scale, which is awesome. Thank you so much to the mix engineer for this track. We also see that the RMS level is at about minus 18, which is on the conservative side of healthy. It's awesome. And the RMS level and the integrated loudness level are pretty darn close, which says to me that this is a pretty well-balanced track in terms of spectrum. Not too much low end, not too much high end. If there's an agreement between LUFS and RMS, um, that usually points at pretty good frequency distribution. Can't use that as a rule, but it's, it's an indication. Another thing I might do is just have a look at the beginnings and ends of the file to make sure that there's not any undue noise. When I look at the end of this file, I can see that there's a little something at the end. It might be a guitar hanging over, and I'll sort of note to self, I might end up needing to fade this track when all is said and done. So I can just get a little initial information about the track here. I'm going to pull over to Ozone Suite. I, if I want to get especially nerdy, I can even play the track and make sure that it's really a full 24-bit file or a 32-bit file. And you can see on the bit scope here that I got all 24 bits going. So they didn't give me a 24-bit file that was actually just a 16-bit file packed into 24. Did I say that we can get nerdy sometimes? There we go. I just did. Okay. So the next thing I want to do when I get ready to master a song is I actually want to listen to it. Does that surprise you? So let's listen to the song. They can take it all.
can take everything You can take everything That I owe I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. It's a cool song. It's got nice dynamics, but not too much dynamic change. You can see that there's plenty of room for the transients to breathe. As a mastering engineer, we're generally, if we are working mastering engineers, we end up working across many, many, many genres. Um, Professionally, it doesn't make sense to have favorite genres. It's only about enjoying the music that's in front of you and finding something interesting about it. This is a great example of a driving, roaring kind of rock track that's got melody. It's, anyway, it's great. Before I dive into doing any of the processing work, there is one thing that I heard, and before I forget it, um, there's a moment coming into the lead in to the chorus out. <laughs> Right there, I feel like there should be a small emotional lift. And while I might actually think about doing something different processing-wise between the rest of the tune and this moment, I'm going to take this opportunity to just give it like a half a dB bump, just so I don't forget. And this is the kind of, I don't know if gain writing is quite the right word, but the kind of adjustment that we can make in mastering to kind of fully realize the emotional intent uh, that we read into a track. I'll come back to that a little bit later, but that sets me up, and this, this cut that I put into the track will help remind me of this change. So listening to this track, I have some thoughts about what I might want to do, but let's say you're just coming to this cold and you're just starting to think about learning how to master, or even you already know how to master, but you want to see how this track might compare with other rock tracks in the world. So there are a couple of different things that we can do. We could pull up something like tonal balance control. There aren't too many things like tonal balance control. Here it is, and pull up the rock genre and hit play and see where this version of rock falls into the rock spectrum. So there's a little bit of a peak around 2K, definitely hear that a little bit in the voice and a little bit in the snare drum. And the low end is maybe a little bit big and a little bit heavy, and I certainly hear that. Otherwise, it's in pretty good shape. If you notice a color in a mix that cuts across a number of different instruments in a mix, that's something that's really, um, it's not, I won't call it easy, but it's well addressed in mastering. If you end up with a scenario where you have two instruments that live in the same frequency range and one's dull or one's got too little energy in that range and one's got too much, that becomes much more challenging. So the fact that I can hear a little bit of that color in the voice and in the snare and maybe even the guitar means that Maybe if I tame 2K a little bit later, it'll benefit all of the members of our rock society. Uh, So that might be cool. Anyway, so 
Tonal balance control can give us some insight, sorry, into the track. We can also take a look at the targets that live within the ozone application. I captured a few specific targets that I'm going to show you in a minute, but you can see that there are genres represented here much in the same way they are in tonal balance control. And if you switch between the targets, you can see that the shape changes a little bit on the screen. If you run the master assistant, then ozone will apply in an EQ curve that moves the track in the direction that we're seeing here. So let me run the assistant. So if you take a look at the rock genre and we take a look at the EQ curve, that the assistant has offered. It certainly picked up this 2K bump. It applied a low frequency dip, which is also consonant with what we were seeing in the tonal balance curve before, and offered some high frequency emphasis and also a mid-range emphasis. It's interesting to think about mastering rock in the context of what it means to be rock. In rock arrangements, usually there's a co-equal voice between guitar, bass, and drums. Unlike hip-hop and modern R&B genres and pop genres, where the low end sometimes leads the charge, and frankly, you'll have less dense arrangements. With rock, you're more likely to have kind of a wall of sound. I'm making gross generalizations, but there's so many different kinds of rock. If we go and, and compare one style of rock to another and look at something like Back in Black by ACDC, right? I've got a tonal balance curve derived from that song. You can see that there's not a lot of sustained bass. And in fact, rock music from the 1970s and the 1980s, generally speaking, doesn't have a lot of very low sustained energy. The bass is more focused around 100 hertz. Let's see, I've got uh, Suffragette City from the 70s, same thing. The low end is rolled off pretty steeply. This is from the day and age of tape, and tape would tend to roll off, especially if you're running at 30 ips, 30 inches per second, it would roll off pretty steeply below 50 hertz, uh, which is why probably modern R&B records wouldn't work so well in a tape format. Obviously, you can adjust uh, when you're mixing from tape, but just as a general statement. Uh, the Mighty Mighty Boss Tones. So we've got a little bit more low end, a little less upper mid-range emphasis. If we look at the EQ curve, what it, would it take to turn this track into a track that would match that curve. Well, again, it's the same basic idea, rolling off low end, a little bit of emphasis around 1K. It doesn't take out the 2K. This seems like this track agrees with the boss tones in the uh, upper mid range. Let's see one more here. So the Foo Fighters. So Foo Fighters are kind of more along the lines of like a modern rock aesthetic. And, and uh, I've got a couple of tracks that are from their most recent album, this curve actually is pretty gentle and is starting to look like something that I probably would end up wanting to do myself. I mentioned before that maybe we'd end up pulling out some of this 2K, maybe I wouldn't add so much on the top end, but kind of a broad dip in the low end. Okay, this seems like it's a good set, gives us a good compass point or a good sense of direction to move. So this is all kind of a long way of saying you can use technology like this to help you derive some insights and think about what you might want to do in a mastering treatment, but you want to start with an idea. If you just come in as a blank slate and then are presented with an option and don't have something to compare it to or an idea to compare it against, then it's a little hard to make decisions. So peak level, as I mentioned, was at minus seven point something. And the RMS level, if I recall, is about minus 17. I don't master by numbers, but I will tell you that the RMS level for a modern rock track with a pretty dense arrangement probably needs to live somewhere around maybe minus 10, minus 9. That leaves enough headroom for the kick and the snare transients to get through. Won't have to be too aggressive, hopefully with a limiter. But the first thing I'm going to do is instantiate a limiter and use the limiter by pulling the threshold down to increase the level with the makeup gain that automatically happens to see how much it's going to take 
to get this track into the ballpark. So now I'm going to get into my headphones here. I'm, I'm not in my preferred mastering environment, so I want to be able to use a reliable reference to hear something closer to what you're going to hear. Here's an invitation for you to put on your headphones or listen on a, a decent playback system. If you're listening on a phone or if you're listening on a laptop, you're not going to be able to hear a lot of the nuance in the low end, but you can always go back later and, and re-watch this many, many times. All right. Right. right now I'm using IRC2, which to my mind is the most tonally neutral of the different modes here in this limiter. I'm barely tickling the limiter and the, the level is just about where it needs to be. So let me see if I can pull the threshold down just a little bit more. This is just an indication that this is a really well-structured mix. We're getting some pretty good drive from the drums, but they're not throwing so much transient information that I'm struggling to pull the level up. Yeah, so that's about where we are. We're down 90 dB with the threshold, which means the most we're going to cross into the limiter is a couple dB. It's just not going to be that aggressive. And I've pulled down the ceiling by 1 dB to make sure that when I render this track out, I'm going to have that little bit of margin at the top of the dynamic range to allow for conversion to MP3, intersample peaks, all of that, again, nerdy stuff that mastering engineers think and care about. Let me just uh, make a couple more adjustments to this limiter. So I just added a tiny, tiny little bit of gentle soft clipping at the top. So when it does get close to the limiter, I get a little bit of, for lack of a better word, a little bit of grit. I've unlinked the side chain slightly differently between the attack and the release phase of the limiter. If you have a fully correlated side chain with a limiter, you're going to get nice, good, solid clarity up the middle, but you won't get quite as much uh, stereo spread. So this helps get a little bit more independence between the way the two channels are being treated. It retains the sense of stereo image in the original track. Now, when I compare before and after with and without limiting, even though there's not much going on, I think you will hear a difference. I've got the gain match turned on here so that when I go into bypass, we will hear a level matched AB. That's obviously the best way to hear differences between the processed version of a track and the flat version. You can take everything you can take everything that I owe. You, you can take everything. You can take everything that I owe. You can take everything. It changes the tone ever so slightly. The low end gets a little bit less thick. It makes sense that the very lowest part of the low frequency transient would be diminished slightly when you use a limiter because that's the thing that will probably encounter the limiter most and most often. The low end is probably the highest amplitude portion of the spectrum. It also sounds a tiny bit brighter. Again, that's not unusual in terms of the signature of a limiter. If I were to change the, the time constants, that would change a little bit, but I, I like the way that the limiter is set up to retain the energy of the track, so I'm not going to mess with that too much. I'm just noticing what the differences are, and now I'm going to leave the limiter in place, because obviously if the limiter is imparting a sound, that becomes part of the sound, and I need to work to it or interact with it. If I were to do all of my EQ or whatever else I'm going to do and then turn on the limiter and the limiter changes things, I might have to go back and, and revisit some of those decisions. Not the end of the world, but maybe not the most efficient way to work. So now let's think about the tone of this track. Going back and keeping in mind what we learned from tonal balance control, let's see what happens if I just do a little bit of feathering at the bottom and try to address this, I don't want to call it nasal, but just emphasis around 2K. Oh, 
Well, that certainly takes care of some of the muddiness down here. I'm not so sure about this 2K. Maybe I'll go up a little higher. I'm feeling like I'm losing a little bit too much of the very deep bass. So I'm going to do something that most of the time I'm reluctant to do, but in this case, I'm less reluctant to do. And that is to try a high pass filter in the very low end. The reason that I usually don't like to use a high pass filter in the bass and mastering is that there are a bunch of things that happen when you implement it, including phase shift. And the result of phase shift usually means you don't get so much clarity in the way the speaker will push air in the low end. You lose a little bit of the thump and the, the sort of good, clear punch uh, almost in the sub lows. In the case of a rock track, especially a rock track like this that even has a little bit of a, a punk aspect to it, the very bottom of the kick drum isn't the most important part of the musical vocabulary. So by taking out a little bit of that heaviness in the very low end, and getting rid of some of the, the thump in the kick, I think what we're going to find is that the kick and the bass marry together in a way that gives us kind of a nice sense of like low end push. I go back and play from an earlier section. Yeah, that's actually kind of cool. It's kind of the whole low end is roaring and the bass and the guitars feel like they're acting a little bit more as a unit. And I really like the energy that's coming from it. And the whole track's got a little bit more clarity. So I'm liking that. Now we are losing just a touch of the sort of jungle rumble of those toms right around 100 hertz. So I'm going to pull up a little there. All right, cool. So the next thing I'm going to do is see if I can get just a tiny, tiny bit more clarity through the the mid, the sort of mid mid range for the guitar tone and maybe even a tiny bit of warm vocal presence. Let's go back to the hot section of the track. I like the way it's coming into focus. It's becoming clearer. You probably are noticing these moves are very, very subtle. This is a good mix. And one of the credos for us in mastering is do as much as necessary and as little as possible. And if that means that you do nothing because you have an awesome sounding mix that you can't make sound any better in mastering, then do nothing in mastering and you've done a really good job. It's not that I'm doing nothing here, but there's no requirement for me to change this any more than it actually needs to be changed. So these little changes hopefully are improving things. One of the biggest things that I'm managing, as you know, is getting the level right. And that means in introducing the limiter. So to some extent, I'm having to work to that. Let's do an A, B of the EQ and the limiting. Stuff. 
So in general, I'm really liking the tonal changes through the mid-range, the presence that's here. I might be able to pull a little bit of this back up, 2.5K or so. And then the one thing I am noticing is that in general, it feels like we've lost a little bit of top end in clarity, and this is top end that I was actually kind of liking in the mix. So let me pull up a high shelf. Now, if I pull the shelf where the turnover frequency is down around 4K or 5K, it's going to reach back down and start pulling up some of that energy that I pulled out here. So I'm going to try to get clear of that and start the high frequency shelf around 7K. Cool, so I like that 10K shelf that I added. I didn't like the way it was pulling up sibilance, so I just stacked a little bell filter on top to make sure that I wasn't adding there. I basically just pulled down enough so that right in that region, I'm not accenting the high frequency energy. Something else I'm gonna try, and this is really in the spirit of experimentation, did not plan this. Curious to see what would happen to make this whole track just tilt a little bit more towards brightness. So I'm gonna stack yet another shelf and I'm going to take the high frequency shelf and bring it all the way down. Let's start at about 180, 200 Hertz and just add like a fifth of a dB. That may sound like an absurd thing, but really it's just like adding level, but omitting the very, very low end to see if it can get us a little bit of clarity, a little bit of gain that favors the clearer part of the spectrum, if that makes sense. I don't know if this is gonna work. Actually, I kind of like it, so I'm gonna go with it. What else would you do? There's so many different things that we could try. The question you have to ask yourself is why try them? Is there something about this track that you're hearing that you think could be better? And if so, then you think about what tools to use. Like let's say we wanted more density in the track. Well, maybe then we'd try a little bit of compression. Let's say we wanted to get a little bit more loudness in the track, we could try an additional limiter. We could try using a little RMS compression in a parallel mode. Let's say you listened to this and thought, well, you know, the whole thing sounds a little bit packed in and could use a little demasking, but the EQ is fine. Then maybe you would use an imager and try to open up the mid range and try and open up the high end. There are lots of things you can experiment with. I generally don't like to spend a lot of time trying things just for the sake of trying things. I try things because I'm hearing something that I think needs to be different. And so that for me is a guiding principle. I don't fall in love so much with the technology for the technology's sake as it is for the way that the technology can make the music sound better and make it sound more like I can imagine it sounding in my head. Just for the sake of experimentation, now that I said I didn't want to experiment, I'll try three things. I'll try playing with the stereo image. I'll try using an exciter to get even a little bit more sort of gritty energy from the, the guitars. And I'll try a little RMS compression.
I mean, it's getting us a little bit more punch in the mid-range and upper mid-range. We're losing a little bit too much of the warmth and the, the sort of thick, muscular goodness of the track. So I'm going to turn it off for the moment. Could come back to it later. That doesn't sound bad. It certainly has the effect of making the guitars, which are panned instruments compared to the kick, snare, vocals, and bass, the guitar tone is a little bit more forward. So that's kind of a, I think I would call this a subjective decision. You notice that I left the low end completely alone. Usually all of the instruments that are panned in mono or most of the instruments in the bass are going to be panned in mono. It doesn't make a lot of sense to try to pull that region of the spectrum apart and it increase the stereo width. This is a general statement, but in the case of this track, I think this makes sense. So one of the things you're hearing when I pulled in the imager and split the spectrum into multiple bands is you, you hear the imprint, the change that the crossovers make. So anytime you use a multiband tool, there's a high pass and a low pass filter that shows up right in this intersection between the two bands. And the high pass and the low pass filter will certainly create a little distortion, especially in the time domain, right around the crossovers. You lose a tiny, tiny little bit of clarity there. So I've got this crossover set at 450-ish hertz. Let me just play this before and after one more time. Let me show you what 450 hertz sounds like. <laughs> Okay. So in that kind of all kind of part of the all the vocal sound, I think you'll notice when I turn the imager on that we lose a little bit of energy there, not because I've done anything with EQ, but because that's the signature of the crossover. So it creates a little bit of clarity, but it also creates a little bit of separation and we lose a little bit of density. So lastly, let me try the excitation. And this will most certainly just want to be a, an upper mid-range phenomenon to grab some of the guitar tone and the sort of noisier part of the rock, so to speak. Remember, days I just consider Again, kind of to taste, um, it, it's still moving us away from the support of the low end. So if I wanted to keep this, I probably would go back and revisit some of my decisions regarding this low frequency shelf. For instance, I might lessen the effect of it or defeat it. This is certainly not unusual for a mastering session. You might start with one treatment, and if you add a second process, then there's an iterative sort of like you go back and forth between them. You change one thing and you might have to go back and rethink your decisions uh, about something else in general. The short of it is, this is a good sounding track. And so 
it doesn't make sense to try to reinvent the sound. I don't need to do too much. I'm trying to reveal and clarify what's there and make sure that everything that I do is consistent with the genre and the style and what I think this artist is trying to express. There's one more thing that I want to go back to, thinking about some of the dynamics within the song and is there something that I could do to enhance the dynamics? And there are a couple of opportunities to do that in this song. One is the fact that there's a, like a rhythmic hook, a musical device that takes place in this track, and it happens several times. The fact that that uh, bagon, the, the pickup to the one, might be fun to try. Maybe leave the first one alone, but I'm going to be bold and take that bagon and just turn it up a third of a dB. Stuff. Just as a moment of announcement, it's kind of fun. Give it a little bit more energy right at that moment to help keep the track propelling forward. So I could do that every time that happens, or maybe just do it a couple of times to create a little bit of almost unconscious excitement. And so now this section, I want to see for the end of the track if I can enhance that sense of arrival. Again, there's an opportunity for kind of an emotional statement in this moment of the track, and it's built into the arrangement. It's not like I'm trying to create something out of whole cloth. I'm trying to enhance something that's already happening. And there are two things that I could think of to do in this moment. One is possibly adding a tiny, tiny bit more compression to create more of a sense of the roar and the density of the track. Let's go here and turn off the gain match. It's even a little bit too much. Just a tiny, tiny hint of it. The other thing I'm going to do is add just a little bit more width in that moment. So the idea is when we cross the boundary into this section, it just gets a little bit more uh, and a little bit more of the sense of space. So it's both angry and the clouds part and the sun shines, if that makes any sense. Hopefully it does. Make up your own metaphors. Let's see how that sounds. All right, so remember when I made that er face? Well, it was a great idea, but the compression didn't work at all. So I'm going to turn that off. But I do like the other changes there, including just a little bit of additional presence as I increase the level, just to give a little bit more energy at that moment in the track. So this is where some of the fun and creativity comes in in mastering, when we can make these subtle little changes to enhance the arrangement or enhance the dynamic that should already be built into the track. Like I said, these are not ideas that I'm just inventing out of nothing. The track is speaking to me and asking me to try these things. There's a, a case study in mastering a rock track. Um, your results, your mileage may vary, and I hope you've got some insights and some prompts and some things that you might want to try. Please don't forget to take a look at the show notes underneath where you'll find links to other episodes where we talk about using EQ and compression, limiters and loudness, and we've covered other topics that live within the umbrella domain of mastering. Watch the Are You Listening mixing episodes from season five with my dear friend Enrique gonzalez Mueller. He's brilliant, and I have the privilege of teaching with him at Berkeley, so I enjoy him very much, and I think you'll learn a lot from him and be inspired by him. I think that's a wrap, so thanks so much for watching, and enjoy your work.